Welcome to Board Game Binge, the place where we bring you bite-sized, bingeable board game content from across the industry. I'm your host, James Staley, and in this episode, we're welcoming back James Hudson, Senior Director of Tabletop for Skybound Tabletop, a division of Skybound Entertainment. Their newest title, Bloodstone, is an epic arena combat board game for one to eight players, and it's already crushed its $150,000 goal. There's still 18 days to go. James, welcome back to the binge. Glad to have you here, sir. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh, it's great to have you. So just very quickly off the top, um, for anybody that uh, maybe doesn't have your full background, we did actually cover that in another episode. Um, if people want to check it out, it's a great, great story. I love kind of the whole history of how this all came about um, and, you know, your creation of Druid City and so forth. Uh, I encourage you to go and check out episode 25. If you go to boardgamebinge.com, top right-hand corner, past episodes, Scroll down to episode 25 and you can get the whole backstory on, uh, on James and his journey to where he is today. But man, what a great story. So James, just off the top, let me just say congrats on this campaign, Bloodstone. My gosh, you Thank guys you. are crushing it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're really excited. You know, Bloodstone has been my pet project for a long time. So I'm, I'm you know, this one's, this one's close to my heart. Uh, I'm really excited for uh, I'm always excited for all of our games. Uh, I think that's just, you know, I'm like a go- golden retriever puppy. I'm just <laughs> jumping around and jumping all over people constantly about like, check out our latest thing. Um, but obviously this one's really close to my heart. Oh, of course. And, and being close to your heart, cause it's a game that you actually created. Right. So, um, since kind of moving over and, you know, getting into the broader scope and team of, of Skybound, mm-hmm. you've got a lot of resources at your fingertips to, start working on some of these other titles that might be linked to IP and so forth. But you kind of teased us in our last uh, podcast that we had with you. You said, you know, this is going to be coming uh, in, in the new year. So it's kind of exciting to see here. So for people who want to kind of know this, so I said it kind of in the intro, 150,000 US uh, was your yep. goal. I like to put it in Canadian dollars because it always sounds larger. Um, so that's $340,000 you've hit so far of a $190,000 goal. Sure. Uh, 2,675 backers, I believe last I checked, mm-hmm. uh, still 18 days to go. So you were definitely yep. on a trajectory for this to be probably one of your top titles. I'm thinking, eh? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely the most expensive game we've ever made. It's, it's definitely got the most components, the biggest, uh, the, the most expensive <laughs> components, uh, you know, which is, uh, definitely a conversation that people are uh, uh, having on the internet, you know, about, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of expensive Kickstarters out there right now. And, and, you yeah. know, value proposition is a very, uh, very hot topic amongst backers. So, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's doing what we had hoped it would do as far as like bringing in people, getting them excited about the world that we've built. And yeah. um, you know, we've, we've poured a lot into the lore of this world because yeah. we feel like this game has the potential to be, you know, I've, in my head, I've got other things that I want to do with it. So yeah, you know, create a whole world out of this, right? Like this could continue like a franchise. This can continue on. Um, yeah. So you create, no, when I was thinking about this, so you created this game, this has kind of been in your back pocket for a while now. Right. So mm-hmm. I believe last we talked, there were some other titles you brought move forward first. Cause you thought this one was a little too beefy mm-hmm. to launch at that time. Yeah. Um, how did the actual game itself come about? What's, what's kind of the backstory of this, uh, like from your perspective? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so back when I first got into uh, board games, I, I, I was actually watching Titan's Grave on Geek and Sundry. It was okay, like, uh, yeah. Will Wheaton's RPG that he did. And he hired a bunch of voice actors and brought them in and they did it a season. And I just I like fell in love with it. But I also fell in love with the AGE system from Green Ronin. Uh, and the stunt rolling. So you take three D six, you roll those and in any matches you get these stunt points. And I just love that whole back and forth. I've, I probably watched Titan his grave the whole season, like seven or eight times. Like oh, wow. I, I love just going through it. Um, but it's um, it's one of those things where I was like those, that D six system, that rolling, that could make a pretty fun combat system for a tabletop game. And so I went and bought like just a, you know, a D and D hex map that you can draw with your yeah. Sharpie uh, and uh, g- grab some stand in minis and made some dice and started trying to build a system. And that's, that's how kind of bloodstone got started. It was my very first game design concept. So you've been sitting on this for a few, quite a few years then, I guess. About yeah. five or six. Yeah. Five or yeah. six years. Yeah. And then the the actual Bloodstone story. So the name, like, was that kind of always part of it? 
uh, from the beginning or was it uh, something you've kind of layered on afterwards and you had kind of a core mechanic and core kind of functionality of the game worked out first? So I, I knew, I knew uh, that I wanted people to be able to resurrect and come back like a video game, you know? Yeah, that's and, cool. and so then you started working through that, like, well, thematically, what does that sound? What does that look like? You know, is it, is it goofy? You know, and you're just like, you don't really explain it. And yeah. I never, I never felt drawn to goofy, you know, I was like, no, I bet I can find, you know, and you just go on runs and you start thinking, what would the world be like if to, to make this happen? Okay. Uh, there's a magical object that somebody has that they can resurrect people. Okay. Well, you know, why would, why would uh, champions and fighters be in an arena that they can't get out of? Cause that doesn't sound like very fun. And so you just start trying to like layer on the different things that you know, you need uh, and then, you know, then the theme kind of grew its own legs and went in its own direction. And then we had to actually come back to the game mechanics and make adjustments to game mechanics to match the theme. So it kind oh, of was, okay. a, was a seesaw uh, for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, the when I, I was kind of digging into this and the, the story of these different characters, uh, there's this kind of asymmetry that you, you, you've built in, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. every character you have is got a different skill set, different kind of approach. Um, now, I guess people just start gravitating towards their favorite character or is there some kind of thing that kind of forces people to try different characters and try different things to try to see how they all play out? No, I mean, it's, it's definitely one of those, you just grab whichever one calls to you, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're very, they're very normal, uh, stereotypical, you know, RPG type archetypes, you know, yeah. like you got the archers and the barbarians and the mage and things like that. So I think most people, uh, will go, Ooh, I really do like playing rogues. And I mean, I see that all yeah. the time, right? Like, Oh, I love an archer. And, but I, th I think what people will see is as they play against other players, um, they'll go, wow, that, that combo that you were playing looked really fun. So next time we play, I definitely want to try that character, yeah, you know, and yeah. that's, and, that, and there's eight of them, you know, in the, in the base game. Um, so there's a lot to choose from. And we worked really hard to make them actually asymmetric and not just like, uh, I always make this comparison in a burrito and a chimichanga, you know, it's like a chimichanga is just a fried burrito. Yeah. Um, so I've never, I've always like kind of rolled my eyes at games that say they have asymmetric. And then it's like, well, this is the exact same character or build as this other thing. It just has one small difference. Yeah. So for one example, uh, when I was you know going through some of the, the reviewer videos uh, that you have on your page, mm -hmm. I think someone was talking about like the rogue, you can actually, that character, you could actually level up and then actually swap out your, your cards mm -hmm. all together. Right. Yeah. So is that functionality only for like one or two characters or can all the characters do that? Is it just, just her. the one, right? Just her. That's, That's her crazy. ultimate. So her ultimate is a tech tree of her initiative card. So she dumps yeah. the, the initiative cards that she starts with and gets a better set, which then gives her faster trigger times and cooler and better, stronger abilities that then she can use to kind of like manipulate the board. Whereas say like Vrock, the barbarian, when he gets an ultimate, he gets to add a D20 to his ongoing role the rest of the time. So he just hits a lot harder. Uh, so, you know, it, it, that's, that's the way everybody, you know, uh, Sinrig, the archer rolls some D twenties and spreads out damage across the board in one big shot. Yawazi, the fire mage, he can actually take life away from himself to keep adding D twenties to this and, but he can only hit one target. So he can probably melt somebody down pretty hard, but he'll also take damage to himself. And so just out of those four, like the four that we usually, we use yeah. in the prototypes that you see a, a very different look, uh, for everybody. So I'm going to share my screen for the people who are actually watching this uh, uh, on the, either YouTube later on or watching it live. Um, I'd like to scroll through the Kickstarter page um, and just kind of talk to some of the elements. Maybe you can talk to the game itself, kind of explain sure. how to play the game and so forth. But before we get there, just really quickly at the top, um, one thing I, I love to point out is when people kind of walk the talk in the industry, right? So mm -hmm. you're very active in the industry, right? And a lot of people know yes. you know that. Um, you know, when I look at... <laughs> the number of games created to the number of backed, right? You're almost at a thousand backed games, right? So that that's yeah. not someone that's dabbling. That's not somebody that's doing a couple token backs just to maybe later on have good optics. That's somebody that is actually passionate about the industry and deeply mm -hmm. involved. So I just want to kind of call that out. That, that was, that's Thanks. incredible to see that at the top. And the other thing I want well, to and I always get the question out and I don't mind answering it. Yeah. Look, how many of those are one dollars? And uh, I actually went back and did an audit. It was yeah. it was sometime earlier last year, so it's been a, probably close to a year. But it was around sixty percent are are were game pledges. So wow. you know, 
six out of 10 times it's, it's a game. And, and I've got the games around me to, to prove that, that there's a lot of Kickstarter games in here. Uh, but there are some times that a game I know is not for me or that, you know, that yeah. I'm not going to get to the table, but I still want to support those creators and, and make sure that the, anybody who follows me gets a ping on something I think is worthy for everybody to take a look at. Yeah. And I don't want to downplay the dollar pledges either. I mean, it, sure. you know, the, it's a great way. And I always say to people that are like, Oh, that looks like a fun game. It's not really my kind of game. I always, I say, well, pledge a dollar. Sure. Give them a backer account. Give them, you know, I, like if I look at your, uh, this campaign here, you've raised almost a thousand dollars just in the dollar or more pledges. Right. That's not an in- insignificant amount of money, right? So those dollars, sure. they do add up. And especially for some of these smaller campaigns, you know, they can be the difference between the person adding maybe a, a thicker card stock or, or something that can kind of upgrade their game. So, um, you know, keep those dollar pledges coming to anybody that, uh, yeah. you know, anybody out there that uh, sees something they like and whether the game is for them or not, if it's just something they just want to support, Gosh, you it, know, it's, it's also very coffee, helpful, right? Yeah, it's also helpful on the business side as we yeah. go to dis, uh, distribution and we talk to our other business partners and we can say, hey, this game, you know, it had thirty eight hundred backers. Well, maybe maybe eight hundred of those were one dollar backers. That still sounds better than three thousand. And so it's it shows that there's there's interest in yeah. the product and the IP. And so you, all of that's useful to a publisher and a creator. The other thing I want to point out before we get into the game real quick, because uh, this was not lost on me, and I don't know if this is probably not the first time you've heard this. Let me just scroll down here real quick. Uh, and I know you, I know you know what's coming. Is uh, is is Vrak based on you? <laughs> no. No? No, but it looks like point, you on steroids. It's awesome. At, at this point, I should probably just not just say there yes, because no one believes me. Uh <laughs> It's uh, so initially when I sent over, it was Travis Fimmel from uh, Vikings. I don't know if you've w- ever watched the show Vikings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Vikings. Uh, and show. I sent that over and I was like, you know, this is what I, I, I think our barbarians are going to have more of a Viking kind of vibe to them or whatever, you yeah. know, and I sent that over and they were like, cool. So beard, mohawk. And I was like, yeah, sounds good. Uh, I should have made him do a blonde hair guy. <laughs> that would have solved all my problems. Hey, I love it. And you know, if you get it, you got the miniature now, so you put that on your desk and it's, uh, it's, it's art imitating life. All right, let's go through the game. Talk to us about this game. How do you, how do you play Bloodstone? So we got kind of the backstory. Sure. How do you play it? Sure. So you're going to, you're going to have two real main modes of play and that's whether, do you want to play player versus player? And again, yeah. I want to keep talking video game yeah, yeah. terms because that's Great kind analogy. of what it's modeled around or player versus environment. And so, um, you know, Again, your play group's gonna, you know, maybe you like both, and you'll have you'll have you know nights of playing both. Um, PvP is gonna be fast, furious. Uh, I call it a meat grinder, hack and slash, whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah. Um, the the rule set is uh, it takes about ten minutes to teach the game, okay. and you're off to the races. And in a a match will take about forty five minutes, depending on player count. You know, 15, 20 minutes per player. Okay. Um, whereas PVE, you know, it's probably more like a twenty minute teach, and all the players are working together against a, a you know, monster or essentially a raid boss. boss if, yeah. if you want to talk about like, say from Warcraft, things like that, yeah. um, that has a puzzle, you know, it's going to, the, the team's going to have to work together and, and strategize together on how they're going to tackle what this boss is throwing at them. Uh, and okay. it's, it's not dark souls level difficult, but you're definitely going to die and you're definitely going to have to reset everything and try again. Like that's going to be part of the process. So you know, that's a great um, tagline. You will die. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're going to die. It's, it's going it, to, you know, and there'll be times where it's really close. And I think the game, one of the things that I'm really proud of about the game is it has what I call stand up moments. You know, you get down to that, whether you're playing PVP or PVE and you're like, okay, I've got at the, it's toward the end, I've got 11 dice in my hand. That's got all these different things going on. All right. If this happens, we're going to win. Or if this happens, I'm going to, I'm going to be able to take you out and win this PVP match. And you throw the dice and you see what happens. But there is, and I know there's probably people rolling their eyes right now with like, oh God, sounds like an RNG fest. Well, I'll just play, you know, roll, I don't know, you know, throw, we'll play uh, some D&D, yeah, exactly. Plays, yeah. You know, whatever, uh, because of dice. And But there's a ton, we've built in a lot of dice mitigation so that your strategy uh, is still, is still useful, right? Like there's still a strategic play with the cards and with the dice mitigation, so. Yeah. It's kind of it's dice draft, like you're drafting the dice essentially, right? So you're rolling, which is the randomness, but you're then kind of 
making choices and drafting based on that, aren't you? Or yeah. So like when you go back yeah. to like my original, uh, in, you know, inspiration from the AGE system yeah. is you've got everyone has three D six as their base kind of operating dice. And when you roll those, uh, we have a terminology, singles, doubles, triples. So think of it, if you're thinking of it like poker, you've yeah. got, you roll it, you get all unique faces, you roll them, you get two matching faces, or you roll them and you get all three uh, matching faces. Yeah. And so that, that opens up your abilities and then you're able to choose how you want to start customizing and building out your character. And some characters have dice that they keep and then they roll in the future with that, with those three D six as their standard. And so now they've got four or five dice in their hand and some characters have dice that they give to other players. And then they're forced to roll those dice on their turn and they can have uh. all kinds of different effects. And so what players have found is, is there's a lot of agency in who I want to attack who do I want to give these dice to and how do I want to spread them out? Like if you're Vrock, he's got these bleed dice that do damage and feed him blood energy. And so he's like, do I want to pile all three of my dice onto one character just to really wreck them? Or do I want to try to get one in every player's hand so that every time everyone's rolling, I'm getting fed blood energy and doing damage. So oh, cool. it, it's a lot of fun agency for the, for the, for the players. Um, and so, but the bosses are just for the co-op mode though, right? Is that, and, and the right. solo modes, the bosses are solo, solo as well. Mm -hmm. Solo, there's a, there's a cool solo mode, uh, working with, uh, Sin Fung Lim and Jesse Wright. Uh, they're great designers in their own. Um, but Jesse is also a big solo player. And so, uh, when he asked me, he was like, Hey, what are, what are the solo rules for the game? And I told him, and he was like, and it was pretty much me saying you play with two, you play it two handed, you know, just play two characters and here's the one caveat you need to put in. He was like, Hey James, can I, can I give you some feedback on that? I'm like, sure, Jesse, whatever. He's like, that sucks. <laughs> and I was like, well, Jesse, I'm not, I'm not a, a big solo player. He was like, do you mind if I take a crack at, at helping you build this out and make it more of a system? And I was like, absolutely. Uh, so he came up with a really neat system where every character has a set of essentially what's called follower cards. Okay. And so you'll pick your main character and then you'll pick a follower. And then this tandem now has the system where you're really trying to like strategize how to use their follower card that turned up and the options that are on that card uh, in that, in that round. And it's, it's way, it's better. It's so better. <laughs> it's so much better. And I noticed like the bosses have like these, I guess for lack of a better word, powers. So like there's one where I see like this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, spike studded hammer that swings right across the board. You got to try to avoid yep. another one. It's like fire. Yep. So each of the bosses have different powers, I guess. And, and are they like tiles that lay on the board for each of them or are they all different or how's that work? Yeah. Every, so just like I was talking about earlier with the asymmetric powers yeah. for the players, it, we did the same thing with the bosses. I didn't want there to be a whole lot of repeat. I didn't want it to be any repeat of a boss mechanic, right? Each one yeah. wanted to feel different and neat in, in a puzzle that the players have to figure out. But yeah, that the first boss Malvar is a big fire demon that has, it's going to, if you've ever played Diablo two, it's going to, it's going to, you're going to be like, Oh, I, I'm getting butcher vibes you know, from this, from this guy, yeah. um, you know, he's got these big fire wheels that kind of spin around that the players have to kind of dance around the arena. He's got these hooks and chains where he's throwing you into the fire. So you can't avoid it. He's got these spells. He's got dice that he puts into the player's hands that have triggering bad effects. So even the bosses that you face in PVE have a similar vibe where you've kind of got like a three layer system. The environment's doing something. They have their own uh, single doubles, triple abilities, just like the heroes do. Yeah. And then they also have their initiative deck that has abilities. So you've got this kind of like three layer onion thing that's kind of like making these weird puzzles that you have to try to figure out. And did I read somewhere um, that you can acquire stuff from the big bosses so when you defeat them? Sure. So and, and again, really leaning hard into the, the video game aspect, yeah. right, is unlocking content. And so uh, when you kill a boss... Like what, who doesn't want loot? It drops loot. Uh, yeah. So you get an item and then that's an item that any, all the players can use uh, going forward. But then also you take those components that are in like those big flame wheels that are spinning around. Yeah. Well, now you've got a card and you've got a way to put that into your PVP matches. So you're just going to be continually unlocking all of this content that you get to move over into the other mode and play it there. That's cool. And is that, so you play like in the next game you're going to play, like, so that sticks with your character. Is that kind of how that works? Yeah. So it, what, we have what was called arena challenges. And okay. so when you're, when you're setting up your PVP game, you can shuffle this deck of cards, right. And then pull one out and say, well, this is what's happening in the arena with us this time as we PVP, 
or you can lay them all out and everybody goes, well, let's, let's play with that one. We haven't played with that one yet. Or, or, Hey, we just unlocked this from that boss that has those big flame panels. So let's, let's do the flame panels. Uh, and then we're going to leave. It's really sandbox like that players, like we really only recommend probably playing with one at a time, yeah. but there is absolutely nothing stopping players from going, let's put three of these in here and see what happens. Um, <laughs> And we've, we've definitely tested it and it gets pretty wonky, but if you enjoy that type of gameplay, then that's going to be there for you to do. Chaos. Now I was also reading somewhere that um, player order matters. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah. So a, a big strategic part of the game is the initiative cards in everybody's hands. The yeah. initiative cards, have, they're like multi-use. So they've got a speed, which the speed is going to determine when you go in the round, then they're going to have an ability and the ability is going to be something that triggers once it's your turn. And then some of the cards have what we call an exile ability, and they're powerful like one-time uses. But then you have to get you have to lose that card going forward. Um, and they're typically tied to very uh, precious cards of your in your deck. You're like either my fastest card, so if I need to go before somebody else is now gone, if I get if I use that exile ability, or my six or my my slowest card, because the the pendulum is the faster the card. The, the lesser the ability, the slower oh, okay. the card, the better the ability. And so you're like, mm, do I really want to get rid of my six because it has my best ability on it? That's up to the players to decide. So forced to make some decisions, some strategic yeah. decisions, I guess, along the way. Yeah. Now you've got some, um, they're not stretch goals, but there's, I guess, um, upgrades. So there's custom mm-hmm. D20s. Is that the, like, it's got, look, literally looks like a drop of blood in, in this, uh, this crystal. It's dial. actually the bloodstone. Yeah. So we've got a model oh, of cool. the actual bloodstone that's like in the logo and that's going to be in the center of those clear D20s. So, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And then there's an arena play mat, I guess, uh, as an add on as well. Yeah. So our artist, David Keg, we were, um, we were just throwing around ideas and it was like, he was like, you know, when we fight the last boss, which we have not, we have not revealed yet. The final boss has not been revealed yeah. uh, as it's the big, the big 48 hour left reveal. But um, there's, there's a bit of a narrative that happens where uh, Gravar, the, the, the boss that we fight before the last boss is essentially Venera's. That's who has the bloodstone currently. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's our antagonist. She, uh, uh, we kill Gravar, which is her like right hand man, Lieutenant kind of thing. Right. And she is pissed. Like she is, furious rage and so what he did is we, we we made the arena scene what it would be at this moment like she is now summoning this final boss that we've got to fight and look what it's done to the arena it's it looks totally different and so we put an alternate art on the play mat um that i thought was really cool yeah it, it looks uh, it, obviously there's a lot of uh care and thought uh that went into not just the game itself but the story and then the artwork that kind of just wraps us all together. Like it is yeah. beautifully designed. Yeah. Um, and then, so there's three different uh, pledge levels, I guess, right? So there's the base game. Mm-hmm. And then the second one, I guess, gives you some more components and the third one's more. How does that kind of work? Yeah. So, the, so base game. And then second level is uh, our novel, which we've partnered with Ari Marmel to yeah. write the narrative, which is, I, I'm, again, that's probably why I'm nerding out so hard about this. Like we've built such an incredible world. It's, oh, yeah. I can't wait for people to get the book and read it. And then uh, it has the price of power expansion. And that is a new game mode that you can play when you're playing PVP. It essentially lets you spend your blood energy. This is a a thing that you can get while you're playing. Instead of unlocking your ultimate, which you can do normally, you can spend your blood energy to buy these, uh, essentially these abilities that you add to your character. So think, you know, in real simple terms, King of Tokyo, when you spend Mm -hmm. your little uh, green energizes to get, cool abilities like you're doing the same thing but with like very awesome abilities in the arena so that that second tier gives you the book and the expansion and then the all in the the final one gets obviously those two things that play mat we just talked about and then a set of five dice to replace the standard d20 uh from the from the game and then i see also you have unlocked um inked minis as well right ink washed uh, minis yeah, that's something we, we wanted to do. Uh, we've wanted to do for a while, uh, just because I suck at painting minis, and yeah. I I put you know I love all of my um, Awaken Realms games that have the sun drop. I, I love that. You know, it makes it easy for me. I don't. They look so much better. I've even got like where we've practiced with the factory from our Valor and Villainy. Uh, my computer doesn't, or my camera doesn't do that great of a job of showing off, but like, obviously, plain with no wash. Yeah, and then wash. And I mean, yeah. just from a distance, you can see 
so much better. There's all the detail. Yeah. It pulls the detail out, the shadows, and uh, it just, uh, just amps it up kind of to that, almost like a pewter kind of uh, vibe to it. Right. It's similar to like the way that we, this is Skybreaker. This is one of the bosses that you'll fight. It's huge. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a, that, I think it's 110 or so millimeters wide there. I mean, uh, I'm trying to see if, I, oh, this is a fun comparison. So this is a uh, D and D miniature. Wow. <laughs> He can just like scoop him up by his head and just take him off. Um, but yeah, like this, this just, they look so much better with just being able to pull that detail out a little bit. And what's this game weigh? Like there's a lot of stuff in this box, right? Like a lot. The base game, <laughs> the, the base game is 16 pounds. So wow. it's pretty heavy. Yeah. Holy smokes. That is. And in terms of shipping, like I know as the shipping costs are seem reasonable. Uh, are you guys having to eat any of that at all? Or because that can't be cheap to ship. No, you no, know, it, it's, game, right? it's, it's one of the things that's obviously a sticking point for some, and I totally understand that. I can empathize. Yeah. You know, Amazon has ruined all of our perception of value when it comes yeah. to shipping, and everybody's like, "Well, why isn't it free? Why don't I have to pay ten dollars?" Well, because it costs us forty-two dollars to ship a sixteen-pound box and a playmat. I don't know if you've ever had a play, if you bought a playmat and had to pay for shipping. It sucks too, you know, because uh, they're weird size boxes yeah. that that take up a lot of room and they charge us a lot. And for for any publisher, not just us, any publisher. Shipping is a pass-through cost. Like we we don't get to mark that up. We don't get to make money on shipping. It's it's literally just a cost of doing business type of thing. And you know, in the past, I think we've subsidized it too much. And when it starts to damage your your P and Ls and things like that, you know, yeah, that's where you just hope folks can go. Man, it, yeah, it does suck that this thing costs forty two dollars to have shipped to me, but that's what it costs. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, shipping is not, and especially post COVID. Shipping rates just went up, folks, right? Like it's, um, but you often see comments online where people say, why, gosh, well, you know, my shipping cost is like half of the cost of the game. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah. half the cost of the game. That's the reality, right? Like, yeah. and, and, and like even, even uh, uh, you know, the game, the, the quotes that we're getting, like right now, the paper and wood uh, went up like 30% in the last few months yeah. uh, for all the supplies that go into China. So, I, I mean, I'm not going to be surprised if we see across the board the price of games inch up too, because oh yeah, th- there's only so much there's only so much you can absorb, right? Like, the price of our our materials going up, the price of shipping going up, all the new VAT laws and and, and custom laws that go into some of those countries now oh, uh, yeah. in, in in the EU and UK, like companies can't just keep saying we'll eat it, we'll eat it, we'll eat it, we'll eat it, because at some point, you, you, I mean you have to make some money <laughs> to be able to stay in business. Oh yeah. Yeah. We actually just covered that in our last podcast with, uh, with uh, ship quest. Uh, we had Nigel Matthews and we talked a lot about that tax and the, the changes to with Brexit. I mean, just all the changes on that side of the pond has mm-hmm. driven costs up significantly. Right. So yep. uh, unfortunately uh, we kind of take the heat from that on this side, but we got to kind of figure it out together as a community and, and try to navigate it. Yep. At least me. The next point is your kit. You've made a pretty bold statement on your page that this is a Kickstarter exclusive, mm-hmm. right? This is just for Kickstarter, not for retail. Talk a little bit about why, why you made that decision and why you put such a bold stake in the ground on that. Sure. The, the, the big thing there is it's, it's, you know, we get, uh, I, sorry, like right now, all I, I deal with comments all day. So the jaded yeah. comments are like, what are right there in the front, right? <laughs> uh, oh, this is a, this is a FOMO play. You're just trying to FOMO us. And it's just, it's just not true. So the reason that we did this, because I mean, we're also saying now we can't sell it after, right? That's a disadvantage for the creator as well. Um, Cause the majority of games sell way more games after the Kickstarter than they do during the Kickstarter. Yeah. But what, what, what happened here is, is because the game is rather expensive, the friendly local gaming stores have a hard time supporting $100 plus uh, games, right? They ties yeah. up a lot of their capital and they don't, they just don't prefer those games. And so, uh, you know, we, I never saw this game having a retail edition. You know, typically on our campaigns, we have a retail edition and we have a deluxe edition. And the Dux, yeah. deluxe edition is the part that's Kickstarter exclusive. You'll know the retail edition will come out later. But I, I never saw, uh, in, for my vision, I never saw this game having cardboard standees for the characters. You know, yeah. I never saw it having basic dice and things like that. I, I wanted it to be a very high end uh, component driven game. So then you take all that into account to know. Um, they're not going to, you know, 
we can't make a retail edition and print thousands of copies at a hundred dollars, even if, if, if no one's going to buy them and stock them. So yeah. it just didn't make sense to do that. So we just said, we should just make the one that goes through Kickstarter. Now as a, as an asterisk, as a caveat, and we've, we've got this in our FAQ. And so it's, it's, it's on the campaign, you know, anything that we have left over, we're, we'll sell through our web store. So there will yeah, be course, some yeah. limited, you know, yeah. you can get them through our web store, that sort of thing. But obviously it's going to be much, then there is at a fixed point on the planet. And if you want to buy it at that point, it's got to ship from our warehouse to wherever you're at, which is going to cost more. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good point too, that, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know um, yeah, there's a retailer markup and so forth. And yeah, the little store, but even you as the, as the manufacturer, right. As the actual publisher mm-hmm. of this game, if you're having to produce a game this costly per unit and you're creating the minimum order quantity, that's a lot of capital. Mm-hmm. that's tied yep. up right while you're waiting to sell it that could be put into something like another game right in the next sure. title or paying artists and different things to you know you know keep growing the industry so it, well, i mean makes, even look at like sense. the, the stone myers of the world too right like I yeah. mean, jamie's jamie's hugely uh you know and he only ordered ten thousand units of wingspan based off of what he thought it was going to do and then obviously <laughs> that that was not nearly enough no. and so this is a game that we play with every single launch yeah. How many, how to, how to gauge interest for a game? Should we, should we do a minimum order quantity of like 2,500 units or, you know, is the demand going to be there? Like, you know, we sold out of our retail print of title blades within a few weeks of releasing it to, to the hobby. Yeah. And we're like, well, I guess we should have printed twice as much, you know, but you don't, you definitely don't want to be on the other end of that where you're sitting on 10,000 units in a warehouse somewhere that that's not moving. So it's, it's just, it's a, it's a hard game to play. Yeah, and the balance for the backers too on that to think that okay, if there's a warehouse full of ten thousand copies of a game and you went back that Kickstarter, that publisher can't sit on that inventory forever. Eventually, they're going to have to liquidate it. Yeah. And now they've just devalued uh, yep. a game and it's probably selling for a fraction of what you backed it on Kickstarter for. So, you know, having this kind of exclusivity, uh, you know, uh, your backers are investing in you as a, as a publisher. Part of the reward of that is uh, having uh, a bit of exclusive content that uh, once it's done, it's done, right? So. Yeah. And that, you know, that that also plays into like the whole thing's a stretch goal, right? Like some people are like, where, where are the, where are the thousands of stretch goals, which we try to get away from the stretch goal game. Uh, And, you know, and like the whole thing's a stretch goal. (laughs) If we don't back it, it doesn't exist. So um, yeah, I thought that was an interesting way that kind of played out on your page as well, that um, you've thrown everything in the kitchen sink into this game, right? Like you've, Mm -hmm. you've not Mm -hmm. cheaped out on anything, right? You've put in basically the max content. You could probably put more, even if you, I'm sure you got even ideas more, but you've got kind of the max content you can cram into a game like this. Like the, even the weight of the game is a good indicator of that. Um, So instead of doing stretch goals, it seems like you're kind of just releasing some of the information along the way. Right. So there's still some discovery elements for the backers that get to Mm -hmm. see some new Mm -hmm. news coming along the way, but it's not framed under kind of like these fake, uh, you see some pages do that. They create fake goals to, to just uh, have that kind of continuous conversation throughout the campaign. Yeah. The, the big thing that we wanted to do there was um, we want to get away from tying more content to a number because it creates some really ugly situations where you've got people in the comments yelling at $1 backers saying, if you just upgrade to the full pledge, we'd yeah. be, uh, we'd have enough money to unlock this next stretch goal and we all get something. And you know, it's just not a, it's not conducive to have a positive campaign. So we, we wanted to move away from that. We did back on Tidal Blades uh, into Wonderland's War. We've moved away from that. And we still have things through this campaign that we're adding content wise. And we still have what we call reveals. Yeah. But yes, we wanted to focus more on the lore and the mechanics and a deep dives into the game so people could pay more attention and get more excited about the game. But we also knew for this game specifically we had some fun surprises. We wanted to design things with our backers. And so like we've already done our first design challenge where they came up with a bunch of different arena like conditions that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And then we actually went into a, a live stream last Friday and mocked up two of the ideas and played a couple rounds of the game with the backers ideas. And we announced today in our update that actually all four that made it to the poll, we're just going to put them all in because they were all fun. Oh, that's and cool. so, you know, and right now we're also uh, designing a brand new hero with the backers. So we're going to get a ninth champion to play. Oh, wow. And all the backers are going in and putting in their ideas for, you know, the story behind this character, what it looks like, what their abilities will be about. And it's it's been really fun. And uh, I, I'm really enjoying 
all of that. And, and, you know, it, is it risky to do this with the backers somewhat, you know, but at the end of the yeah. day, they're also, we're also going to work on balancing it out for them and making sure that the, their idea, whichever one wins uh, plays well, you know, well, it's still a part of building that community, right? And if people feel like yeah. they're part of the process, no matter how little that might be, it's still they're part of the process, which I think brings a lot. Like of we've got cool. Like I think we're going to stamp on like the mini for this. That's like creator backed, you know, on the base. Oh, that's cool. I just feel like that kind of stuff's cool, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, I like it when I get to do that because obviously I back a lot of campaigns. <laughs> uh, so whenever those opportunities are, are there, I really enjoy them as well. Well, certainly it shows. Um, you know, from the number of campaigns you've backed, you, you've clearly absorbed uh, what it is that makes a good campaign, what yeah. it is that builds excitement and interest. Uh, you know, every campaign we've been, Tidal Blade is a great example of this too, is a lot of the excitement uh, yeah. around it and building these worlds out, I think has been, uh, it's been pretty cool to see come from, uh, from your company. So. Oh, and don't James, yeah. I, I get, I get it wrong. Plenty. We make plenty of mistakes, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, there's things right now on, on bloodstone, you know, if, if I had a magic wand, I would try to probably just, you know, mess around with and, and, and do it over. But that's kind of part of this whole thing. Like, I mean, I've really only been doing this three and a half, four years, Yeah. you know? And, and when you look at it from that, you're like, I'm an infant, you know, our company is an infant as far yeah. as when it comes into like, you know, the AEGs and people who've been around for years and years and years. And uh, so, you know, you learn something every campaign and you, you know, you, sometimes you take some swings on things and, and they work and they work great. And sometimes you, you whiff, you know, so that's part of it. I think it's good though, that when you have newer publishers are going to not know what they don't know and try yeah. something that maybe hasn't been tried before. Right. And that might bring yeah. in something new to the industry that maybe hasn't been tried in the past. And I mean, who, who would have, excitement. Who would have thought when we saw Gloomhaven when he was like charged almost nothing for shipping on that enormous box that that was going to work out for him? You know, <laughs> I remember seeing that going, oh, this guy's done like that. Yeah. He's going to eat his shirt shipping these enormous 30 pound boxes all over the world. But it kind of worked out for Isaac. He's doing OK. <laughs> what do you guys got coming next? Yeah, another game on the on, on the horizon or? Yes, we've got so we've got two more Kickstarters this year because we we okay, a lot wow. of stuff got pushed back uh, from last year, obviously because of COVID. Yeah. So we've got Bloodstone, we've got Valor and Villainy Two, uh, which will be coming in May June ish range, and then Tidal Blades Two is coming later. Oh, this cool! Year. So really, really, I'm I am really excited for Valor and Villainy Two. It is just fun, tongue in cheek RPG goodness by a design by a newer designer who who's like Valor and Villainy One was his first game. And uh, he just came, he came out of the app industry. So he's got a different kind of different approach to things and his games are just fun. There's a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Well, it certainly shows uh, your passion in, in all you do. Um, I, I can't wait to see where you guys land on this campaign. It, uh, it is, it is doing incredible and it's going to, I predict it's probably going to be the biggest one yet. Uh, that's just my prediction. It is certainly <laughs> headed that way. <laughs> and uh, if anybody wants to back this campaign, uh, in the show notes, I'll put a link to the Kickstarter page. If you go to Kickstarter, you just search Bloodstone, you're going to find it. It's on, sure. uh, I think it's even on the recommended, uh, Kickstarter recommended list now since it's doing so well, uh, so quickly. Um, but if anybody wants to find it, click in the show notes, you'll find it. James, thanks for coming on the podcast. I want to wish you all the best this coming year. Can't wait to see how all these campaigns uh, play out. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. No worries. You take care. Cheers. All right. Bye. All. This has been an episode of the Board Game Binge Podcast. Hosted by James Staley, produced by James Staley and Mike Bruner, with original music by Nick Smith. If you would like to watch these interviews live, simply join the Facebook group Board Game Binge, and you'll get access to live interviews, giveaways, and interesting board game content from across the industry. I can't wait for you to join us. See you next time. We'll be right back.